necessary for you to uh, take an, uh, to be sworn, do you take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? An oath on the Bible. On the Bible. Now, I think there's a Bible there, which is a... You know, can you take that in your hand, please, and stand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God... That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission... That the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission... Shall be the truth... Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take your seat, please. Yes, Mr. Stewart. <clears throat> thank you, Honour. Do you have a copy of your statement dated 10 July 2015 with you? Yes. Are there any amendments or corrections you'd like to make to that statement? No. Do you confirm the statement? I tender the statement, Your Honour. Uh, it'll be come Exhibit 29 one <coughs> I'd ask you, uh, BCB, um, to read your statement, perhaps commencing uh, at the third paragraph. My full name is BCB. I was born on Redacted, 1967, and I'm 47 years old. I'm married to BCC and we have two daughters. My husband owns a Redacted business and I work for him keeping the books. I was formally baptised as a Jehovah's Witness when I was 18 years old. I grew up on a farm near Wikipen in Western Australia. I lived on the farm until I was around 19 with my dad, my mum and my younger brother. In 1977, when I was about 10 years old, my mum became a Jehovah's Witness. Between about 1977 and 1979, my mum used to take me and my brother with her to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses meetings each week in Corrigan. Corrigan was about an hour's drive away from where we lived. <coughs> okay. My dad and I were quite close up until I was about 10 years old. CB, would you like Mr. Stewart to read your statement, please? No, thank you. I should be all right. But, but any if you, point need, I if you can... need a pause, or you want Mr. Stewart or your husband to help, then let me know. Okay. Just to adjourn for a minute? Just a minute. <laughs> okay, we'll adjourn very briefly. You let, you let us know when you're ready. Yep. But if you want your husband to read or Mr. Stewart to read, that's quite appropriate. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a brief pause and come back when you're ready. All stand.
go. Okay. My dad and I were quite close up until I was about 10 years old. However, when I started attending Jehovah's Witness meetings with my mum, we drifted apart emotionally. My dad wasn't a Jehovah's Witness and never attended Jehovah's Witness meetings with us. He never stopped my mum, my brother or me from attending Jehovah's Witness meetings. In or around 1979, my mum and dad decided that I should go to high school in Narragin. Narragin was about an hour's drive from where we lived. Because I was at school in Narragin, my mum decided to join the Narragin Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. My mum, brother and I attended meetings there every Wednesday, Friday and Sunday. The Sunday and Wednesday meetings of the Narragin Congregation were held at the Narragin Kingdom Hall and were attended by the whole congregation. At these meetings, one of the elders would usually deliver a public talk from the platform based on a reading from the Watchtower magazine or give a talk from the Bible. At these meetings, the elders would also lead question and answer sessions and give specific training about our door-to-door -door preaching. The Wednesday meeting was referred to as the Theocratic Ministry School and children were allowed to give talks about the Jehovah's Witness beliefs at this meeting. I remember that I sometimes gave talks at these meetings. The Friday meeting was re referred to as book study and usually took place at someone's house. This, at this meeting, a small group of families would come together to discuss biblical scripture. I first met Bill and Bronwyn Neal and their children at a large Jehovah's Witness party in or around 1979 when I was about 12 years old. Bill and Bronwyn had a daughter named BCE who was two years younger than me. BCE and I became very good friends. In or around 1980, Bill Neal was one of two elders at the Narragin congregation. At the time, I understood that Bill's position as an elder gave him authority in the Jehovah's Witness community. He used to give talks at the weekly congregation meetings from the platform in the Kingdom Hall. The other elder in the Narragin congregation at the time was Jack Shaler. I looked up to Bill because he was an elder. Everybody in the congregation respected and trusted Bill, including my mum. Between about 1980 and 1986, I spent a lot of time with BCE at the Neal family house. I used to stay at BCE's house at least once a week. Often I would attend the Friday night book study meeting led by Bill at the Neal's house and then stay over at the Neal's house until the Sunday meeting at the Kingdom Hall. BCE mum, Bronwyn, or BCE's mum, Bronwyn, treated me like a daughter and I felt really close to her. I used to call Bill Uncle Bill. I recall that the Neal family talked a lot about church issues in the house. They used to discuss their belief in Jehovah. Bill in particular used to explain that all ideas and ways of behaving should be figured out according to what the Bible says. I remember that Bill would discourage BCE and me from forming friendships with other children who were not Jehovah's Witnesses at school. The Neal family always seemed to me to be an affectionate family, which I really liked. For example, everyone always kissed each other on the lips when they said goodnight or goodbye to one another. I remember that Bill and Bronwyn were very open with their kids about sex. Bill would often make sexual jokes in front of me. My mum never talked about anything to do with sex. I had grown up understanding that it was not something that you were supposed to talk about. In or around 1982, when I was about 14 years old, I was staying over at BCE's house as I did almost every week. I was having a shower and BCE, who I often shared the bathroom with, said, "'What's that on your tummy?' I looked down and noticed I had a rash on my stomach. Despite me not wanting her to, BCE went and got her mum. I only had my knickers and a singlet on. Bronwyn said she wanted to show Bill. I said I don't want him to see me. I never let my dad see me in my knickers, so I was really embarrassed. Bill came and looked at my stomach, and I remember feeling really uncomfortable about him seeing me like that. <coughs> Later in 1982, I was again staying over at BCE's house. On this night, as I was saying goodnight to Bill in the hallway at their house, he kissed me goodnight on the lips. Initially, this did not seem unusual to me, but he then stuck his tongue into my mouth. I pulled away and looked at him in shock. He looked at me and gave me a queer, smirk-type smile. I found myself half smiling back. 
I was so surprised by what he had done that I just froze. I didn't know what else to do. Every time I stayed at the Neil family house after that night until the end of 1986, I had to endure Bill tongue kissing me goodnight. This often occurred in the hallway just outside BCE's bedroom. Apart from putting his tongue in my mouth when I stayed over at BCE's house, Bill's behaviour towards me did not seem to change. He continued to behave the same way around his family. He continued to lead the Jehovah's Witness meetings and to be respected by the rest of the congregation. Since nothing was said about what he was doing to me, I felt like I had to be, act like nothing was happening. I really didn't know what to do. I was scared and ashamed. I felt that I was somehow responsible for what Bill was doing to me. I felt like I couldn't say anything about it because I was worried that I would get into trouble and that Bill would belt me like he belted his kids when they were naughty. I respected Bill because he was an elder. He was also BC's dad and the head of the Neil household. But I had also come to fear him because of his position as an elder, I felt that I couldn't tell anyone about what he was doing to me. I felt that if I told someone, it would upset Bronwyn and BCE as well as the members of the congregation. Every time I thought about bringing what was happening to me out in the open, the consequences were too scary, so I stopped thinking about it. I felt like no one would believe me. A few months later, after Bill had once again come and kissed me goodnight at his house, BCE said to me, did my dad just kiss you for a long time? I assumed that BCE must have seen Bill kiss me. I was scared of getting into trouble, so I said to her, don't worry, it's okay. I thought at the time that by not telling BCE what was happening, I was protecting her. I thought that if she found out, it might cause her family to break up. I now wish I had told her. On one occasion, in or around 1983, Bill and I were out doing door-to-door -door preaching together. I remember that at some point, we were alone in Bill's combi van. Bill said to me, what shall we do about our little problem? I said to him, I don't know. Bill then asked me, do you want me to talk to Brother Shayla about it? You know if I do that, though, your mum and dad will find out. I replied no to Bill because when he mentioned that my parents would find out, I got scared. I was surprised that Bill suggested speaking to Brother Shayla. At the time, I already felt guilty about what Bill was doing to me. But when Bill suggested speaking to Brother Shayla, it removed any doubt in my mind that what was happening between Bill and me was my fault. At the end of 1983, having completed year 10, I left high school. The following year, I studied a business course and in around April 1984, I got a job, redacted. I continued to stay at the Neil House regularly from around this time until the end of 1986. One night, in or around 1984, when I was about 17, I stayed overnight at the Neil family house. While I was showering in the bathroom with the door locked, I heard a noise. I looked up and saw Bill perving on me over the top of the shower curtain. I guess he must have been standing on the basin to be able to see. I don't know how, but I assumed that Bill had unlocked the bathroom door from the outside. I screamed, get out, at Bill, and he left the room. Bill and I never spoke of the shower incident. On another night, also in 1984, and not long after the shower incident, I remember that Bill came into the BCE's room where she and I were making lots of noise and threw me over the bed. He started belting me across the buttocks with his belt. It really stung me and afterwards I had a dark red welt across my backside. Apart from the physical pain, I remember feeling humiliated, angry and shocked by, Will, by, by what Bill had done. On 26th of October 1985, I was formally baptised as a Jehovah's Witness in a ceremony that involved being submerged in a pool of water. At the baptism, many of the other girls wore modest swimming costumes with t-shirts over the top. 
I remember that Bill refused to let BCE or I wear t-shirts over the top of our swimming costumes. In or around 1985, when I was around 18, I noticed Bill's behaviour towards me became more sexual. He used to say things to me in front of his wife, Bronwyn, and in front of BCE, like, you're a nymphomaniac, and if you weren't in the truth, you'd be a prostitute. What he said didn't make sense to me, because I was a virgin. I recall that on one occasion, in or around the end of 1985, Bill tongue kissed me in this lounge room. As he was doing it, I heard Bronwyn say sharply, Bill, I remember thinking that we would be in trouble, but nothing more was said about the incident by Bronwyn or Bill. Up until the summer of 1985-86, I thought Bill's behaviour was just something unpleasant that I had to put up with so I could have a good time with BCE and the rest of the Neil family, who I liked. One day in the summer of 1985-86, while I was in the pantry in the kitchen of the Neil family house, Bill came in, shut the door and started kissing me. As I was older by then, I felt able to try and resist his kissing. Bill yelled at me and said to kiss him. He pushed me up against the wall and told me to pull my dress up so he could see my underwear. Thankfully, someone came into the kitchen and that, at that point and Bill stopped and left me alone in the pantry. In or around October 1986, I left my job, redacted, and I was very unhappy at the time because I was feeling pressured by people in the Narragin congregation to preach full time. After I left my job, redacted, I moved into the Neil's house for a couple of months while I was looking for a job for a new job in Narragin. BC was still living at home when I moved in with the Neil family. Bill continued to harass me while I lived at the Neil house. At the same time, he remained a respected elder in the congregation. I became really resentful of him. I stopped referring to him as Uncle Bill and instead referred to him as Bill. Looking back, I think this was my way of rebelling against him. One day, at the end of 1986, when I was 19, I had been having a shower in the family bathroom at the Neil's house. Although the rule in the Neil's house was not to lock the bathroom door, I used to lock the door because I wanted my privacy. That day, I had just stepped out, stepped out of the shower and was naked when the door suddenly opened and Bill walked in. I don't know how Bill unlocked the door. I guess that he may have unlocked it with a knife or even his fingernail. I know that Bill didn't walk in by accident because of the way he quickly opened the door, closed it again behind, me, behind him and stood against it, trapping me inside. Bill then told me, sit on, sit on the floor and open your legs. I didn't want to do what he was asking, but his manner was very threatening. I felt humiliated and scared. Would you be able to read the next bit? I felt humiliated and scared. Bill then started fondling me and put his finger in my vagina. He then told me to stand up and he proceeded to perform oral sex on me. I felt disgusted and uncomfortable. I knew that sex was something that people were meant to enjoy and I remember thinking that there must be something wrong with me because I didn't like what was happening. The next day, I was lying in bed in my room, feeling sick, when Bill came into the room. He said to me, did you like it? I assumed he was referring to the bathroom incident. Pointing at his crotch, he said to me, it's better with this in. I asked him to leave, and he did. Once he had left the room, I got up, packed my bags, and went home to my parents' farm without saying goodbye to BCE. In or around early 1987, I remember telling BCE that I had been seeing a couple of boys not long after I told her that, B BCE told me that Bill wanted to talk to me about my relationship with boys. She told me to meet Bill at the Neil family house. Even though the meeting was at his house, I understood that I was being asked to see Bill in his capacity as an elder and that I had to do as I was told. I would never have chosen to speak to Bill about my relationships with boys otherwise. When I got to his house, Bill asked me to wait in BCE's room. He came into the room and asked me, can, we, can you show me your boobs? 
Although I had come to expect this behavior from Bill, I remember feeling shocked that he was asking me this. I remember that I let him look down my top. I don't know why I did what he asked. Looking back, I feel as though he could control me. Bill then said to me something like, can you make yourself orgasm? I said yes, and he replied to me, I thought so, you dirty bitch. Bill was an elder for as long as I knew him. I wasn't able to see at the time, but everything he did to me was in complete disregard of all the Jehovah's Witness rules, some of which he preached about sex and association between brothers and sisters. In 1989, I told my now husband, BCC, that Bill used to kiss me. I dreaded telling him, and I couldn't bring myself to tell him any more detail about what happened than this. When I told him, he started asking me questions about what exactly had happened, and I said to him, don't worry, it's all over now. I didn't want to say anything more because I was scared that BCC would tell someone. Later, in around 1991, a Jehovah's Witness acquaintance of mine, BCF, told me that she had been abused by her uncle and that she had tried to commit suicide. I told her what happened to me, but I didn't mention any names. Somehow she guessed that I was talking about Bill. I freaked out and asked her not to tell anyone. I guess that BCF did, did tell others in the congregation as a week or so later, a young elder from the congregation called Max Hawley came to speak to me. Initially, I had no idea why he'd come to see me, but he eventually revealed that he'd come to talk to me about Bill and me. When he said this, I burst into tears. I told Max about most of what Bill had done, but I couldn't mention the final bathroom incident when Bill had had oral sex with me. I was so ashamed. Max was very kind and supportive. He told me that what had happened was not my fault and that I shouldn't blame myself. Soon after, Max arranged a meeting with Bill, BCC and me at my house. I don't remember anyone explaining the purpose of the meeting to me. At that meeting, Max said to me, I believe, I believe Bill asked you if you wanted to see his penis and you said no. I assumed that he was referring to the incident in the bedroom the morning after Bill had oral sex with me in the bathroom. Even though I had not told him about this incident myself. Bill looked at me and said, don't you think I was joking? And I said, I don't know. I didn't understand why someone would joke about that sort of thing. Nobody at the meeting said anything about Bill's comment. I still don't understand why no one at the meeting told Bill that you shouldn't joke about those sorts of things. I did not talk about the incident in the, in the bathroom at that first meeting. I didn't feel comfortable talking while Bill was in the room. After that first meeting, I felt like there was a lot of stuff I hadn't, had been unable to say in front of Bill. I decided to go to Max's house after the meeting to clarify things. As a result of our conversation at his ma house, Max organised a second meeting at my house. The second meeting was attended by Max Hawley, Doug Jackson, Bill, my husband, BCC, and me. Doug Jackson was the circuit overseer for the Nelligen congregation. Max told me this meeting was a committee meeting. I was not aware at the time what the purpose of the meeting was or why Doug, Doug Jackson was attending. During the committee meeting, Bill was defensive. He said that I used to wear revealing clothing. I remember that Doug Jackson made it quite clear to both of us that the church has never allowed the victim's clothing as an excuse. Throughout the meeting, Bill looked at me defiantly. I felt like he was challenging me to tell the full story of what he had done. I felt uncomfortable and could not bring myself to tell the elders everything that had happened. I felt like I was still Bill's victim. I was still so scared of saying anything that would get me or Bill into trouble. I remember that at one point in the meeting, Max said to me, is there anything else you wish to tell us? I remember looking across the room at Bill and saying no. <clears throat> it was already very hard to talk about sex in a room full of men. It was especially hard to talk about what Bill had done to me while he was sitting there in front of me. I didn't feel like it was a safe environment and I was scared of what the consequences would be if I told the whole truth. Perhaps if a sister who I was comfortable with had been there too, it might have been easier. At the end of the meeting, 
the elders asked Bill to say something to me, so he said, I'm sorry. I took that to mean that he was sorry for everything that had happened, although his demeanour was not in any way remorseful, and I could tell that he wasn't sorry. Nobody explained to me what the outcome of the meeting was or if anything would happen to Bill as a result of what I had reported. After the meeting, Doug Jackson gave me a magazine article that had been published by the Watchtower a few years before. He encouraged me to read through it. The article was about child sexual abuse. At the time, I don't think I had thought of what had happened to me as child sexual abuse because Bill hadn't had sex with me. But reading that article made me realise that what, would, what happened to me was child sexual abuse. I don't remember discussing contact to the contacting the police with anybody at that time, either before or after the committee meeting. Not long after the committee meeting, Roman Neal rang me and asked me about my conversation with BCF. I said to Bronwyn, BCF told me that she had been abused by her uncle and I told BCF what had happened to me. Bronwyn said to me, Bill didn't abuse you. I got scared, so I said to Bronwyn, I didn't actually say that. What I told Bronwyn was true. I had never actually used the word abuse when I spoke to BCF or during my discussions with elders, as I hadn't understood at the time that I had been abused. As soon as I got off the phone to Bronwyn, I rang Max Hawley to tell him about what Bronwyn had said to me. He told me that he'd sorted out. Later that day, Max rang me back and said to me, BCB, the Neils have asked that you not tell any more people about Bill out of respect for the family. I respected Max and did as I was told. I didn't tell anyone else about what had happened to me, not even my best friend at the time. Thinking back, I now see that I was being asked to respect the man who had done those things to me, but nobody was offering me any respect or proper support. A few weeks after the committee meeting, the elders announced to the congregation that Bill had stepped down as an elder. I was sitting in the congregation at the time. The elders did not announce to the congregation why Bill was standing down. Although I understood the reasons for privacy, I have still since felt that people in the congregation should have been warned about someone like Bill. After the committee meeting, I don't recall being offered any support by Doug Jackson or Max Hawley, though it's possible that they may have said something to me. Overall, however, I remember that I didn't feel supported. No one in the congregation talked to me about what had happened to me and Bill's wife, Bronwyn, ignored, ignored me for some time. This was especially hard because I loved Bronwyn like a mother. Even though I had reported what Bill had done, I was still expected to attend book study meetings that were being held at the Neils' house. I continued to see Bill several times a week at congregational meetings and at annual district conventions. Everything just seemed to carry on as normal, but I felt physically sick every time I saw Bill. I continued to attend the Narragin congregation for three more years and continued to see Bill at meetings during this period. In 1994, I moved out of the area and started attending a different Jehovah's Witness congregation. I understand that Bill has since died, although I don't know when. I still consider myself to be a Jehovah's Witness and until very recently attended meetings at the Redacted Congregation in Western Australia. In or around December 2012, I provided a written statement to two elders in the Redacted Congregation. Their names are Joe Bellow and David Wood. The statement summarised Bill's sexual abuse of me. I provided Joe and David with my statement as I thought that others might have also been abused by Bill and that my statement might be able to help support their cases. In or around July 2014, Joe Bellow came to visit BC, C and me at my house on an unrelated matter. During this visit, I raised the subject of Bill's sexual abuse of me and told Joe that I was considering reporting my story to the Royal Commission. Around the same time, Joe Bellow rang and had a conversation with BCC on the phone. During the conversation, Joe said to BCC, you should ask BCB if she really wants to drag Jehovah's name through the mud. When BCC told me what Joe had said, I felt upset. It was not me that gave Jehovah a bad name, it was Bill. For some time after the visit from Joe Bellow, I was quite upset. 
My mother encouraged me to write down my feelings. So I wrote a note recording my feelings at the time about Bill's sexual abuse of me, the response of the elders at Narragin Congregation, the response of the elders at the Redacted Congregation, and my reasons for reporting my story to the Royal Commission. Sometime after, my mother handed this note to David Wood, one of the elders in the Redacted Congregation. The handwritten note is at wat.0001.002 0.0497. In around September 2014, I contacted the Royal Commission and reported my story. I have huge feelings of guilt about coming forward with my story. I feel as though I am betraying the Jehovah's Witnesses and bringing reproach onto them. When I speak to officers at the Royal Commission, my chest gets tight. I have heart palpitations and I have difficulty breathing because of my anxiety about the betrayal. Since reporting my story to the Royal Commission, I have stopped attending meetings at Redacted Congregation. I am sad about this because it means that I no longer see a lot of my friends from the congregation. Telling my story to the Royal Commission has brought up a lot of feelings of anger in relation to what Bill did to me and the way I have been treated by the Jehovah's Witnesses. I've spent too many years suffering over this whole situation. It has held me back from living a normal life and I really want to move on. The abuse definitely changed who I was. It destroyed my confidence and my self-esteem. Even though the sexual abuse stopped when I was 19, I have continued to feel like Bill's victim well into my adult life. I continued to keep Bill's sexual abuse of me a secret for a long time. Over the years of our marriage, I have told BCC more detail of what happened with Bill. It wasn't until just before my nervous breakdown, um, actually that's 10 years, uh, 12, about 12 years ago, that I finally confided fully in some of my friends. Once I started talking about what happened, it was like opening a can of worms and I became very ill. I was lucky to get help from a wonderful psychiatrist. I've had a lot of therapy to address what Bill did to me, but I still have trouble feeling a sense of closure about what happened. I still feel that Bill was never made to face any consequences for what he did to me. I felt like Bill's position as an elder continued, contributed to his power over me. I now think that I was brainwashed into thinking that people speaking to people outside the church or to the worldly people would bring reproach upon Jehovah's name. I think that I, had I been allowed to speak to other non-witness, non-Jehovah's Witness children at school, Maybe someone might have reported what happened to me and I wouldn't have become the victim that I feel I am now. As Bill is now dead, I don't have to worry about seeing him at Jehovah's Witnesses conventions anymore. I still tr struggle with my thoughts and feelings about the abuse, but I have an amazing group of spiritual sisters and friends, as well as my lovely husband, BCC, and my two beautiful daughters. I would like to see a number of things change in the way that the Jehovah's Witnesses deal with child sexual abuse. First of all, I would like the Jehovah's Witnesses to take allegations of child abuse more seriously and report them to the police. I also think that those victims that are brave enough to report to elders should be properly supported and protected. I definitely did not feel protected when I disclosed my abuse to Max Hawley and Doug Jackson in 1991. I found the experience of reporting my abuse to a room full of men including the man who had abused me, very distressing. I've never been offered any compensation by the Jehovah's Witnesses for what happened to me. And I've never made any claim for compensation because I didn't think that I would be entitled to any. I'm worried about what others will think of me asking for compensation. I know that many people have been through worse suffering than me in their lives. I don't want more than I'm entitled to. I only want to be treated fairly as a victim of abuse that was perpetrated by the member of the Jehovah's Witnesses. I just want fair and just compensation for what Bill did. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a, a few questions I want to ask by way of um, clarification or, or elaboration. 
you speak in paragraph 12 of your statement, and perhaps that can come up on the screen. Um, about meetings um, being held, including uh, at someone's house. Were those meetings organized by the elders? Yes. And after Bill Neal had stood down, after the elders had met with you and so on, and, and he stood down, you say in paragraph 16 that you continued to attend meetings at, at the Neal's home. Did he, as presiding overseer, or who organized those meetings? Because he was no longer an elder. Were those meetings organized by? They must have been organized by Max Hawley. So those types of meetings, are they always organized by, by the elders? Yes. In the congregation? Yes. <coughs> and did you ask not to have to continue attending meetings at the Neal's home? I didn't. I, did, did I ask? I did ask to change book study groups. That's right. I asked to go to the one at the hall. Was that so you did not have to attend at the Neal's home? Yes, I didn't want to because Bronwyn wasn't talking to me and I didn't want to see Bill in their house. And who did you ask that of? I don't remember, but maybe I, maybe I spoke to my mum. Maybe I asked Max. Rena said, mate, oh, my God. That's all right. That's all right. PCC said, maybe I spoke to Max. I don't remember. All right, that's fine. You don't remember. Do you remember what response you got? Um, <coughs> I, I was just told that I had to go there. All right. If we scroll up to um, 17 on the statement. You say in the last um, sentence that you remember being discouraged from forming pre friendships with other children who were not to have as witnesses. This is when you were still at school. Yeah. Did okay. you have an understanding of why why you were discouraged from forming such friends, friendships, or what was said to be the teaching behind that? Um, there are a couple of scriptures. Um, one was bad association spoils useful habits. And the other one was that Jesus said that we are no part of this world. So, um, I, I had friends at school. They were nice girls. Um, but we were just friends at school, not outside of school. And in what you were taught as a as a young girl growing up in the Jehovah's Witness Church, were you taught anything about the police or how to view or understand the police and their role? No, I don't remember anything specifically being said. And you say in paragraph um, 30, perhaps you can go to that. said at the end of 1983, having completed year 10, you left high school. Why did you leave high school at, at that time? Um, I, the Neils didn't encourage um, further education. And they encouraged uh, us to either get married and have children or to pioneer, which is pledge full time. And so I 
didn't really consider doing T TAE as it was in those days. Um, didn't consider going to university. Didn't. It wasn't a consideration for me. And so I was going to leave after year 10, but my dad said, you don't have any qualifications to get a job. So he encouraged me to do a year 11 vocational business course, which was actually part of the school. And I'm glad he did that because then I was able to get a good job. And he was, your father was not part of the Jehovah's Witness Church at that no. time. And your experience of, of what the Neils told you about, presumably their daughters about, um, leaving school, was that something you experienced in other families in the Jehovah's Witness Church? It just wasn't, university wasn't really talked about as an option. Most people just left after year 10 and got a job. You can look at your paragraph 73. say that after you contacted the Royal Commission and reported your story, you had huge feelings of guilt about coming forward with the story, and you felt as though you were betraying the Jehovah's Witnesses um, in doing so. Um, are you able to identify what is, what is the source of that guilt? Why do you feel that it's a betrayal? Because it's, it's an ugly story and it doesn't, it doesn't portray them in a very good light, like the people who dealt with my, the brothers who dealt with my situation. And I feel like, I'm, I, I do feel like I'm dragging Jehovah's name through the mud. in your statement some details of the impact that the abuse has had on your health. Is there anything you'd like to add in relation to that or anything you'd like the brothers to know about the effect of child sexual abuse? Yeah, I've been... Um, when I had my breakdown, um, I, I was not well before that. I was going downhill for a long time before that. Um, I was getting paranoid. I was thinking that... Um, I was thinking that people at school, when I dropped the kids off at school, I was thinking that they were all talking about me and judging me. I was thinking that the neighbours were all... Um, judging me, talking about me. One, one morning, the lawnmower man came to mow the lawns and I thought he was going around to all the doors and windows and deliberately trying to scare me. And I went into the games room with the kids and hid behind the doll's house and I said to them, don't let him see me. And they were laughing at me and going, what's wrong with you, mummy? And I think I scared them a little bit, or they just thought I was being strange. And when I told my friend about what happened to me, because she she knew, she guessed that this is my when I, this is the reason why I had my breakdown was because I I told my close friend about a little bit about what happened, and she. She knew who it was, and um, just I got scared that it was all going to come out and everyone was going to know about it, and it really scared me. And the next couple of weeks, I lost 
15 kilos because I was so anxious and I was really sick. I, could, I couldn't get out of bed. I had no energy. I couldn't get out of bed. And I was hyperventilating. I was breathing into a paper bag all day long. And one day, my dad was staying with me every day. So probably scared for me. And he said, have you eaten anything today? And I said, no. And he said, you should eat something. So he made me a piece of toast and I was chewing it and chewing it. And I ended up having to spit it out because I had no saliva in my mouth. And thank goodness I ended up going to a psychiatrist and he put me on antidepressants. And Otherwise, I, I don't know what I would have done. I just wanted to go to sleep and not wake up. I thought about taking sleeping pills, but I just kept thinking about my husband and my kids and I couldn't do it to them. I have no further questions. Does anyone else have any questions? No, Your Honour. I do, Your Honour, if the court. If the Commissioner, sure. please, I do. Thank you. you do? Yes. <clears throat> um, PCB, obviously I represent you before the Commission. If I could take you to <clears throat> excuse me, your initial complaint, if you like, to uh, BCF. Yes. <clears throat> and that you talk about it at um, paragraph... Uh, excuse me, I think it's... 48 of your statement. <clears throat> she had indicated to you that she had suffered abuse from her uncle. Yes, right. Um, and then you told her, as you note in your statement, that something had happened to you. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Did you give her any details about, not about the perpetrator, but what had happened to you? A little bit. Like, I know I said in my statement that I told her what happened to me, but I didn't tell her everything that happened to me. I just said, um, I said something similar happened to me. Um, did, she give, did she give you the specifics of her abuse? Uh, not really. Uh, that was a long time ago. I can't really remember exactly. So when you say something similar had happened to me, yeah. um, did you tell her any more about what had happened to you? Yes, I, well, I told her about how my friend's father had uh, used to st stick his tongue in my mouth when he kissed me and that he came into the bathroom and burped at me. I think that might have been all I spoke to her about. Uh, oh, I did tell her about him coming into my room and wanting to show me his penis. Because the next thing that you can recall, just in relation to how these meetings came about between, uh, with, with um, Max Hawley and Doug Jackson and Bill Neal, um, is it the case that you were out um, uh, preaching? Yes, yes. And Max drove up to you? He drove up to me, yes. I was out in the preaching work and he drove up to me and he said, oh, can I come and visit you this afternoon? And he wanted what, to visit. Who were you with at the time, if anybody? I think I was with my husband. And... Do you remember what you said to him when he asked, can I come and visit? Yes, I said he could come around that afternoon, yeah. And did Max come alone to your home yes. on that occasion? Yeah, the first do time. Do you remember what he said to you? Yes, he, he started talking about if, if, uh, if you told a friend something, some information that was quite serious and they, and, 
And they said, you should tell the elders. And you didn't want to. I can't remember exactly how he said it. Did you eventually work out what he was talking about? Yeah, he was trying to, trying to, he was trying to, I think he was trying to explain that BCF was feeling, obviously feeling bad because she told someone about what I'd said mm. and was because worried about my reaction. Was, was it the case that um, <clears throat> you realised that that he was talking about the... the that's when I realised that... Contact with Bill Neal. That BCF had told somebody about what I told him. And you burst into tears at that yeah. time. Yeah. And the, the next thing you recall is, is it the case that um, there was a meeting um, with Max present, is that right? Mm -hmm. Doug Jackson and... Um, uh, no, the next one was... The next meeting was Max and Bill and my husband and I. So Max and Bill and your husband and yourself. Yes. So two elders were present. Yes. Um, but one of them was your abuser. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Um, and w was that at your home? That was in my lounge room. Yeah. At the time, did you um, feel... <coughs> I'll withdraw that. You were 22 at the time, is that right? Uh, yeah, I think I was 22, yes. Okay. We'd just been married for a couple of years. And you were both in the faith? Yes. Right? And you remain in the faith? Is that right? I'm taking a break. Right. Yeah. But at the time, you certainly, um, is it the case, didn't feel that you could question the process of what was occurring? I was just doing as I was told. And when you say just doing as you were told, do you mean from uh, Max? Or yes. Else? You I, I, I assumed that he he knew the pr correct procedure and I was just going along with what he said because I respected him. Mm. Were you told by Max that um, if there had been indecent contact between you and Bill that you could go to the police? No. That you should go to the police? No. That it was criminal behaviour no. that you were alleging? No. Um, <clears throat> when... Bill attended, um, Bill Neal attended with Max. Um, were you pressed for detail as to what Bill had? Yes, Max, Max said, um, I believe that Bill, in, in the course of whatever they were asking me, he said, I believe that Bill asked you if you wanted to see his penis. Mm. And I said, yes. And then Bill said, looked at me and said, do you think I was joking? And I said, I don't know. Did you feel at the time that you were really being invited to question your own belief in what had happened? Yes. I was... I was questioning whether I misunderstood. Mm. And um, the, the next meeting was also at your home, is that right? Yes. And um, present was uh, Doug Jackson and Max Hawling in, in Bill yes. again. Yes. Um, looking back on it now, how do you feel about the appropriateness of the first meeting, Max coming with Bill, your abuser, to your home? I felt very, very uncomfortable. <coughs> I couldn't say anything about what really happened with him there because I felt like he still had control over me and what I said and and that whatever I said would be he would be cross-examining me and saying that it was my word against his so when you say he would be cross-examining you meant your Bill. abuser, Bill, Neil. Yes. Um, you were fearful of that and indeed it did occur. Is that right? Yes. 
um, and in relation to the second meeting, um, you describe in your statement as Bill was, was defensive and I think you described defiant as well. Yes. Spoke about you revealing, wearing revealing clothing. Yes. Um, did you feel the same way in the sense that you were, your, your version, your credibility was being tested? Yes, definitely. And that you weren't being supported in yes. your version of events? I didn't feel supported at all. Did you understand what the process was? No. Did you understand why this was occurring, why these people were attending your home and violating your space, if you like, in relation to this inquiry? I didn't question their methods because I thought they would know the correct procedure because they were the authority in the church, in the church premises. And did you understand it was an inquiry as to whether or not um, Bill should remain an elder? Was that ever explained to you? Um, not really. I guess I still just thought it was my word against his and that they were just trying to find out what happened. Were you, having been raised from 10 um, in the faith of Jehovah's Witness, did you understand the, the rules, if you like, about when someone makes an accusation against another? That is... With the, minor incidents, you approach the person and try to sort it out with each other, if you can. If you can't, you... I, I know now that you can talk to two trusted friends, two trusted sisters in the congregation. Can I, I didn't understand that at the time, though. I don't know whether that was ever a rule. rule. Um, when I say a rule, do you understand that it's a uh, reliance upon biblical teaching is, is noted for this, that um, for someone to be found guilty within the church of wrongdoing or that in, within the faith they have to either have confessed or that there be two or more witnesses I don't I didn't know any kind of I didn't know that um, now <clears throat> you um, can I ask you this did you feel when um, the two elders were at your home at the second meeting and Max was present with Doug and Bill. Did you feel in control of the process? No. Did you feel supported? Well, no, I didn't feel supported. I guess in a way I was trying to control it because I didn't tell the full story. Yes. Um, do you feel now that you should have been encouraged at that time to go to the police? Yes. You have an understanding now that um, Bill Neal's conduct towards you in relation to the tongue kissing is at least uh, assaults of an indecent kind? Yes. And that the incident in the bathroom where you were penetrated and the oral sex performed upon you were arguably incidents of sexual intercourse without consent? Yes. Um, just in relation to um, the process that took place, do you think that there? Do you think you should have been confronted by your abuser at the time in your own home? No. And do you think there should have been females involved? Yes. Um, did you feel during the process that, particularly when? Um, you, when Bronwyn phoned you, someone that you loved and cared about, uh, Bronwyn phoned you and uh, indicated to you that um, Bill ha hadn't abused you. You'd given evidence about phoning Max and telling him about that and then Max calling you back and saying, please stop talking about this effectively. Um, out of respect for the, family. the Neil family. Did you feel that that was the 
the emphasis, respect for the Neal family? Uh, at the time, I just did as I was told. <laughs> Um, in relation to the issue of compensation, it's the case that you have um, spent seven years um, in therapy with a psychiatrist. You're no longer seeing a psychiatrist at the moment, is that right? No. And you're, you're currently on antidepressants, you remain on antidepressants. Yes. You're currently um, undergoing neuro-emotional therapy with a chiropractor. Yes. All those things, of course, have cost you money, correct? Yeah. And you would welcome the compensation if it were offered by the family, is that right? Yes, I would. Is it the case that you're also grateful to the Royal Commission? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank Anna. you. Thank, thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Thank you, BCB. Thank you for coming and telling us your story. Okay. You're thank fully you. excused. Witness, Your Honour, will be Max Hawley. Do we have any better copies of Mr Hawley's statement? The ones we've got are quite hard to read. It's being arranged, I'm told, Your Honour. Mr Hawley, it's necessary for you to be sworn. Would you take an oath on the Bible or an affirmation? There's a Bible there which I think may be appropriate. You hold it in your hand and <coughs> repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give in this Royal Commission that the evidence I give in this Royal Commission shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Yes, thank you. Take a seat, please. Yes, Mr. Stewart. Would you honor like to wait until no, no, keep going, coffee. keep going. But, uh. Uh, Mr. Hawley, do you have before you uh, a copy of your statement, uh, which is... I think we need to identify him first. Dated. I think, I think we need his name first. What are your full names, Mr. Hawley? Full name? Maxwell Frederick Hawley. Do you have a copy of your statement, 7 July 2015, before you? It's... Are there any corrections or amendments you'd like to make to that statement? No, I think it's okay. Do you confirm the statement is true and correct? Yes, I tend to the statement. It will become Exhibit 29-2. <coughs> Mr. Hawley, you've been a Jehovah's Witness essentially your whole life, is that right? That's correct. You have been a Dawesville Congregation Elder since November 2012, and you served there as Secretary, is that right? That's correct, yes. And you were appointed in an Elder in the Narragin congregation in 1988, and you served there as secretary too, is that right? Yes, that's correct, yes. And there was only one other elder there at that time, that was Bill Neal. When I was first appointed, there were two elders, 
Uh, one was quite elderly, and I think he then moved back to Perth, so that left Bill and I. Um, later on, there were two other elders appointed, and um, we had a situation arose where they, uh, one was stood down and one moved away, so that left Bill and I at the time that this incident occurred. And the, the, the first elderly elder that you referred to uh, who moved back to Perth, was that Jack Shaylor? That's correct. And when uh, Bill Neal was stood down in 1992, you became the presiding overseer, is that right? That's correct, yes. Speaking generally now, as, but in your experience, as secretary of a congregation, what files or records do you keep? We keep copies of the letters that are sent from the branch. We keep uh, publisher record cards that report all their time spent in the ministry. Um, we collect that information each, each month and send the, the details to the branch. Um, we write letters when someone moves to another congregation. We send a letter of introduction along with that. We also receive letters from other congregations when publishers move in. Um, we keep records of um, committee cases that are held, um, judicial committee cases and things like that of a, of a sensitive nature are kept on file too in case we need to refer back to them at a later time. But those are only usually seen by the ones on the, acting on that committee. So. Is there a, a file or a, or a record for each member of the congregation? No, only the publisher record card, which details how much time they spend in the ministry each month. And in respect of the files of a sensitive nature or records of a sensitive nature that you, you describe following committee um, hearings, judicial committee hearings and so on, for how long are those retained? I know we've had some information recently that uh, after a certain period of time they are destroyed, but ones uh, involving uh, this, this particular type of case are supposed to be kept indefinitely. And who has access to those uh, records. If it's a judicial com case, then only the committee members that served on that committee, I understand, have access to go into that. It's, they're all kept in the same place, but in the congregation I serve in now, all of the elders have access to the congregation file if they need to refer back to some of the letters that are on there or other records and so on. <coughs> And what information or records are passed on uh, to the branch office? Uh, the report each month for how much the ministry is uh, conducted by the congregation is compiled and that's sent each month. Uh, each year there is um, information logged about different activities in the congregation, how many publishers there are, how many unbaptized publishers and so on. That's just a brief overview. That's also sent to the branch. Um, if, if we need, if they request information, then we might need to send a letter to them requesting that information. Um, and sometimes for clarification of, of information, we might contact them in that way. I gather from the documents I've seen that the congregation elders will also report to the branch on the outcome of judicial committee hearings. Oh, that's correct. So, yes. Now, if we could have a look at paragraph um, 2.2 of your statement, that's on page 2. see in the last line you, you mention uh, victims being encouraged to report abuse. Uh, are we to understand that as reports to the elders? 
Is that right? Yes. <coughs> and also in 2.3. Uh, in the last sentence, you say the relevant viable principles make it clear that failure to report another's wrongdoing can make them <coughs> responsible before God, and this is emphasized to the congregation. I take it again that the reference there to reporting another's wrongdoing is to report to an elder. Yes, in Leviticus, those that become aware of uh, wrongdoing, not actually having done it themselves, but if they hear of it, then they report it to the elders so that um, if the person isn't forthcoming, then uh, the elders can step in and handle it. So these references in these two paragraphs to uh, reporting, that's not reporting to the secular authorities? No, it's just to the elders at that stage. Uh, is it the expectation that a member of the church must report any other member's wrongdoing to the elders? Or is it only particular types of wrongdoing? The encouragement is, depending on the seriousness of it, I guess, too, is that they go to the, um, the person that's committed the wrongdoing and encourage them to go to the elders first and basically making a proviso that if they don't, then the, the person that's become aware of it will approach the elders and let them know of it. Does that make myself clear enough? So I can understand that in respect of say, less serious issues that arise between people? Um, are there particular kinds of transgressions or wrongdoing or sins, as I understand you would call it, that must be reported to the elders? Sins that we would have brought to the elders' attention more uh, of a serious nature, things that could result in a judicial committee case being formed, so matters of a sexual na nature and, and things like that. Um, other matters where it's just someone's upset at somebody, we would encourage them to go ahead and, and try and sort that problem out themselves if it um, became worse and eventually the elders were called in to try and arbitrate or whatever. But normally following the Bible principles that is they try to work those situations out themselves. And can you assist by explaining where the line is drawn or how the line is drawn between what's of a more serious nature requiring reporting and what isn't? Yeah, the more serious uh, nature are things set out in the scriptures that could re result in someone being removed from the congregation if they're unrepentant. So um, sexual immorality and all the stages and things that that covers that are, um, homosexuality, bestiality, all of those sorts of things. Um, and that would include child sexual abuse? Absolutely, yes. And those, those things are the ones, I take it, that are set out in uh, the handbooks? Yes, how, how we go about um, instituting the protocol and, and handling of those, of those aspects, yes. Now, turning to the case specifically of um, uh, BCB, and perhaps we can have up on the screen paragraph 49 of BCB's statement. Now, you'll see that... Um, BCB has said that that you asked to speak to her on the basis of information you had received. Um, do you recall or remember the person BCF who is referred to there? That's a friend of hers to whom she had spoken. The first name of that person which we're avoiding saying... Yeah. It should be on a list in front of you. Yes, I, I remember, but I don't remember her coming to see me. Do you remember how you first got to hear of these issues that BCB raised in relation to Phil Neal? From my recollection, 
it was BCB and BCC that came to see me at my home and tell me about the allegations. When you say, um, from your recollection, you seem somewhat hesitant about that, is that because of the passage of time? Yes. yes. Mr is... Hawley, um, this allegation, I take it, when it came to you, you would have seen as a serious one. Absolutely. It was a huge um, breach of trust, Your Honour. Yeah, and uh, it, as a consequence, I, I assume it would have stood out for you at the time? There's something unusual? At the time, it was uh, something that I hadn't dealt with before, and yes, it was um, a very serious nature. I, I took it as a huge breach of trust, not only for the person involved, but for the whole congregation. It would have repercussions that would flow through. And the matter was reported to you because you were in a position of responsibility? Yes. Did you take any notes? No, I didn't. Um, can you help I us? I may have done at the time, I'm sorry, but... Um, you may have done. I may have. But Where are they, they now? They would have been destroyed. Why? Um, we don't like to have any notes outside of what's kept on file in the congregation. Why don't you like to have notes of a serious allegation? There, there are brief notes kept in the file, but all other notes are, are destroyed. Why is that? Uh, I... I, I guess it's because we don't want them to fall into the wrong hands and other people to find them and, and they go through them. What are the wrong hands? Um, well, we don't want our wives knowing what our stuff, um, what sort of things we're dealing with. We don't want other pe people in the congregation coming across that information. So you want to keep it secret to the elders. Is that what it amounts to? about secret, but um, we want to try and limit the amount of people that have to have a look at that information, yes. And why is it that you want to limit the people who will have access to the information? Just to protect them, I guess. Uh, we don't... As protect, protect who? Protect the person that's uh, involved in it and the rest of the congregation so that they don't have to know these... It's just, just the protocol that we've had, and so we just follow that information. And would you do the same thing today if someone came and reported to you a serious allegation of sexual assault? Would you destroy any notes? Yes, that's our practice. Um, and what about telling other authorities? Are you aware of your obligations if someone tells you of a serious allegation of sexual assault? We, if, if we have any hesitation, we contact the branch for advice on how we should proceed legally and scripturally. Um, we don't attend or we don't report it to the police. I think we encourage them to do that, but we give them the assistance to do that if they need that. How do you encourage people to report to the police? Standing's a little bit unclear because I've never had to do it, so I'm, I'm not fully aware on the process. But um, if if it did come to me, I would be just saying, you know, look, this is a matter that you need to talk to the police about or the legal authorities and, and pursue it that way. Uh, the allegation that came to you, you accepted, was serious. Have you, in your time as an elder, had any other people come to you to report a serious allegation of a sexual nature? Not of sexual assault, but uh, generally misconduct on their own part or someone that, that they know of. What do you mean by misconduct? Well, if, if someone's committed immorality with somebody else, then uh, that's been brought to my attention, um, either by the person that's done it in, in the way of confession, or it may be that they've heard about it and brought it to my attention and we've investigated it and handled it that way. Yes, Mr Stewart. <coughs> you 
said a moment ago to um, His Honour, Mr. Hawley, you said that in relation to reporting to the police, uh, you would say to the person, look, this is a matter that you need to talk to the police about or the legal authorities and pursue it in that way. Now, what sort of matter would that be? What sort of matter in your mind would be one that you would say to someone, they must go and report to the police? It would be in the matters of an abuse situation where someone had been forcibly, um, uh, something like this, this instance, or probably even worse, or um, if that someone had been raped or um, you know, that sort of a matter where, where police proceedings would be needed. Now, in this um, particular uh, case, what were you told initially? You say you, you spoke with um, BCB and her husband. What was reported to you? That the, the elder concerned had acted inappropriately while she had been staying at, at his home. Um, the, from my recollection, it was more to do with the fondling of her breasts. Um, but I th think there was also an accusation about him watching her in the shower. And um, so and that's that's from most of my recollection. I think there was inappropriate kissing of some sort too. But. And these events occurred when she was a minor. That's correct. She was staying at his home. Um, she'd finished school and was working at a bank. And because her family lived 45 minutes out of town, she would stay with them during the week and go home to her family on the weekends. And did you... Did it occur to you that these were serious uh, allegations that were made? Any breach of trust, and particularly by an elder at the, in that situation, was viewed very seriously. And that fondling the breasts of a minor, but indeed anyone without their consent, would be a crime? I think that occurred to me at the time, and certainly has done since then, but the, um, the way that we handle it now is totally different to what we did back then. Yes, well, we'll stick with back then for now. Yeah. And uh, observing someone whilst showering without their consent, this is it's a serious allegation, not only within the church's view, Absolutely. but even outside the church. Mm. And uh, inappropriate kissing. In other words, by that I, I take it you mean tongue kissing. That's that's what I understand. Of a minor. Yeah. That's a that's a crime too. Did that? Did you appreciate that? <coughs> Probably not. Like I should have done. Well. It, it shocked me to have that accusation brought to my attention. I knew it wasn't right. I didn't realise it might have been a, a criminal matter. Though. And did you give any consideration to whether you should report it to the police? I didn't, no. Did you give any consideration to whether BCB should be encouraged to report it to the police? No, I didn't. Very well, we'll take the luncheon adjournment. Stand.